Are you an adventurer looking to take your hunt to the next level? Then you're in the right place. Welcome to East Meets West Hunt with your host, Bo Martonic. Hey everyone, we're back with another episode here and I'm really excited to get this episode out to you with Nick, Allie, and Marta that I recorded, um, I think it was last week or the week before. And uh, these guys are a great group of people that uh, we're going to go into some interesting topics that I've got gotten a lot of questions on, uh, basically surrounding, you know, chasing your dreams in the outdoor industry, growing up in a, a non-hunting family and, you know, kind of becoming hunters as well as just just the the Pennsylvania hunting tradition, kind of like we covered a little bit in last week's podcast with Jason Mears and a whole bunch of different topics that, that I'd, I really enjoyed sitting down with all of them at, uh, at Nick's camp. And I'd, I really think that, that you'll get some value out of this podcast. And we also kind of got into their new business venture with Worn and Weathered, which is a lifestyle apparel company that um, they'll explain a little bit more about it, but definitely need to check out everything they're doing if you're not familiar already with what um, Allie has done with her Outdoors Allie brand and everything else. So this podcast is definitely going to be one worthwhile listening to from beginning to end. With that being said, I wanted to uh, talk a little bit how the Pennsylvania hunting season ended this past weekend. Got to go out with my family and just just have a good weekend of going out and trying to help my my uncle get a buck, who's the last one in the the family to that had a buck tag that needed filled. And unfortunately, we weren't able to do that, but got to see a bunch of deer. Had a good time. Go to some new areas and you know do a little bit of uh, exploring there. So got some fresh snow. It was just a, a great weekend to be out in the whitetail woods. With that, uh, the Pennsylvania season is now closed. And for anyone here in Pennsylvania, now the only chance that you'll have to to kill a buck will be in the late season, which is um, an archery and muzzleloader season um, that'll be begin on December 26th and run through, um, I think the second or third week in January. The, the, one of the issues that, that, uh, has been, I guess, brought up and during this rifle season, that's been weird is a lot of people are shooting bucks that their antlers are falling off as soon as they shoot them. They either, either when they're dragging them out or walking up to them and, and even some people finding fresh sheds already. So I guess there's a lot of different theories on why deer lose their antlers at certain times and everything. And and I kind of want to give a little bit of my opinion on that. And I'm not by any means an expert on this. And But my thought is, is the way that our, our season has went this year, well, we had a really wet fall and everything. And the rut was, was um, I believe the rut happens the same time every year, but whether you're seeing daylight activity or not um, depends on weather, moon phase, a whole bunch of different things that, that people, again, a lot more intelligent than I am, can speak on better. But this, this year specifically, we got some really cold weather, some um, heavy precipitation in the form of snow, everything else. Um, in late November here. And it, I think it put a lot of pressure and a lot of stress on these deer and couple that with rifle season and, you know, 600,000 plus hunters entering the woods, um, for two weeks. I I think that stress of the weather and the hunting pressure right after they just got done going through a rut, um, you know, a, a long rut that was, you know, wearing down their bodies, everything. Normally they use this time of year to recover, you know, get food and and build their, their bodies back up to, you know, a healthy weight and get some fat on for the winter. 
And I really think that this cold weather and along with the hunting pressure didn't allow them to do that this year. And that added stress, you know, it could have been a, a reason for all these antlers dropping early and, and falling off. So that's, it's, it's been real interesting. I'm going to try to dig into that a little bit more and try to learn more about that. But that's just my theory with it. So take that with a grain of salt. But uh, another thing I want to get into here before we uh, start this this episode is just released a brand new hat to the apparel line. And I haven't really talked about the apparel line a whole lot on the podcast itself. I've kind of kept them a little bit separate. But so we have East Meets West Hunt Apparel. And what that apparel is, is... It's an outdoor lifestyle apparel company. It, this isn't, um, for the most part, it's not, you know, high performance um, stuff that you, you're wearing hunting and everything else. But what it what it is, is something that, that you can wear out in the woods, whether that is hunting, if you want, um, or if you're, you know, just out scouting, um, you know, shed hunting, working out, you know, going for runs, things like that that you can still wear this stuff out to, to dinner, you know, out in public places. It's, you know, a, an apparel company that kind of covers that avenue, something that you have an afternoon, you're out looking for sheds, you go in to, you know, grab a beer and a burger uh, with some buddies, and that apparel is still nice enough looking and has a performance aspect to it that you can do both of it with it. So that led into the new product that were just released, and that's called the Arrowhead Active Hat. So the Arrowhead Active Hat is based on a Richardson's 220 uh, R-Active Light platform. So this hat is extremely lightweight, moisture wicking, and also has UPF 35 in it. So this hat is meant to to you know once your heart rates up you're you're sweating you're you're moving moisture a lot that this hat is meant to perform in that kind of aspect and none of the other ones that we have out there are really a a performance style hat they're more of a lifestyle hat where this one is is built for that whether you're you know crushing workouts at five in the morning getting ready for your first elk hunt in september or you're going on evening trail run up in the mountains or just again looking for you know sheds scouting in the springtime anything like that this hat was built for that and instead of putting my normal logo on the front of it went through and added the arrowhead logo that i designed that it incorporates basically like an old style arrowhead with um like a pine tree and a, a deer track in the center of it real simple um, not in your face, just a nice looking logo. And this, this hat is in slate color. Um, so kind of like a light, like a lighter tan type color, um, or, or tan and with a dark Brown logo and lettering on that. So really cool design, excited about that. And as with all of our apparel, 3% of the proceeds go to backcountry hunters and anglers to, help in the fight to keep public lands in public hands. So please check that out over at the website, www.eastmeetswesthunt.com backslash shop. And you can find all of our apparel, our decals, um, stickers, hat shirts, everything is on there and check it out. And if you would, you know, if you like it, purchase it, help support the podcast, help keep things running here. Um, yeah, so that's that's that. And um, if you would sign up for the email subscriber listing up to this point, I haven't done a whole lot on the blog with some different articles and things like that. But I'm really trying to get that ramped up here in this winter time. A lot of ideas I've had put it together, some gear reviews, things like that. So if you subscribe to the to the email listing, you'll get updated when those are released and be able to check that out. So with that being said, let's uh, get on to the podcast here and hope everyone's doing well and had a successful hunting season. All right, we're back for another episode of the East Meets West Hunt Podcast. 
and I'm sitting here in a cabin and just outside of Warren, Pennsylvania with uh, Allie DeAndrea. Yeah. I got that right. <laughs> got it. Nick Berger and Marta Dozy. Did yeah. I get that right? Yeah. All right, cool. So we're sitting here, um, rifle season in Pennsylvania, snowy. Allie tagged out. I did. I tagged out opening morning at maybe 7.30. Yeah. It was like right at first light. So I'm all tagged out. Nice. Nick? I still got a buck tag and a doe tag. Yeah, I still got my tags too. So Mm -hmm. I'm right there with you, buddy. Makes it more fun. It does. It just, you get to hunt longer, you know? Exactly right. What about you, Marta? Do you hunt? I do. I'm trying to tag out tomorrow. I have a buck tag. Oh, yes. perfect. Well, that's great. So are you guys up here all week or what's what's going on or all season? Yeah. So we have been here for about a week. We hunted opening day of rifle season here in Pennsylvania. And we had a friend shoot a buck uh, the day after I shot a buck, actually. So we had two back to back. Um and now we have the weekend coming, which means friends are coming. So Marta and I and Nick will all hunt tomorrow. I think Marta and I will actually hunt together. Nick will probably be off in a stand by himself. And we'll have more friends come in on Saturday. So it'll be another week of hunting and trying to fill tags. Yeah. 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 And it's we're supposed to get, I think we're supposed to get snow here tonight. Yeah. And then like freezing rain again tomorrow, kind of the story. Yeah, and Saturday's oh, yeah. going to be a mess. Yeah, it's going to be rain. And Opening day was a mess too, and we still saw a lot of deer. It dumped rain, yeah. Oh, it was miserable. It was miserable. We heard significantly less shots than in years prior. Mm-hmm. Even today, I I got out at 3.30, and I bet I heard 20 shots. Really? And opening day, might have heard five. Yeah. Maybe. I think everybody just looked outside and was like, nah, Not I'm good. Today. Yeah. So, yeah. and, um, but by the time this, this podcast rolls out here in a few weeks, I, um, I'd really already talked about this story, but on Monday I shot a buck and didn't find it. Mm. So I had, I had, uh, I was, I went into this area on Thanksgiving day in between going to family dinners and I found this really nice eight point out in this fresh logging cut feeding and went there the next day to kind of look for a spot for a stand and he was in the same spot again i'm like this doesn't happen you know in the big woods having a deer in the same spot two days in a row especially rifle season yeah right before rifle i mean when people are out and in in the woods and they uh i talked to the logger that was in there and he goes yeah they're just feeding on these fresh tops Mm. and um long story short i had a chance at them in the morning um, I had a little tree stand incident where I was kind of hanging from my tree stand first thing in the morning. Oh, no. And uh, what do you mean? I, yeah, tell us more. So, my bottom platform climber. Got, yeah, I had a climber. Mm. I went up about 25 feet, which is higher than I n- yeah. normally go. I usually only go like 12, 15 feet. Yeah, I'm right I'm, there with mm-hmm. you. I don't go up high, but to kind of, I was in a wide open basically. So, I wanted to get up higher, and my platform was angled down. I didn't have it up enough to begin with. Mm. And I'd done this in the past, which it isn't the greatest idea, but with my climber, you can kind of adjust it on the fly on the bottom. Well, the tree was so big that I was on the last leg of it and I adjusted it and the whole strap let loose and came out. So I was hanging by my arms, like on the bar for, you don't have clips. Uh, They were tied together, but like, I didn't, it was, Oh, you mean the clips fell out? Oh, I pulled them out (laughs) to, to loosen it. No, no, no. I know that. But the rope that attaches your seat to your yes. your platform. So that was still on there. But it was too tall. And my and it was still attached to my feet. Oh, so it was okay. there. But I couldn't reach down to get it back in because the it was like a cable. So it was sticking yeah, yeah, yeah. straight out. One of the and summit ones. Yeah. yeah it, it, was a, it was a hawk one. But okay. it's the same exact same concept. concept. And... And for those that are listening and obviously can't see, we're making a lot of hand motions, but <laughs> which I, I do all the time oh, on here. Oh, I talk here. with my hands too. <laughs> and uh, anyways, the I, I couldn't reach down for it. And I'm like, well, shit, I'm just, I'm stuck here. So I was kind of hanging from holding my arms up and I was tied off to the tree. But if I drop, what am I going to do? Go until my legs, you know, cut out of circulation. Mm-hmm. And... So I, I just kind of sat there for a little bit and didn't know what to do. 
and my legs were starting to go numb. So I was like, I kind of, I got to figure something out soon here and was able to get, there's like the stabilization strap that goes on the top seat. I was able to throw that around and get it connected. So I knew the top was secure. And then I, I slid my knees up on the seat. And, um, at that point I was able to get my feet up high enough where I could some weird way, if you just saw the position I was in to get it back in, but yeah. I, I got it. Get a little blood flow too. Yeah. So I, I got back in there and I was just a nervous wreck cause it was tough not to panic, you yeah. know, in that scenario. Dangling and from 20 feet. Yeah. I'm like, holy shit, I'm going to, I'm going to die up here. Not, I mean, not really because like I, I was, I was tied off and then I also, what I learned up in Alberta was I always keep a lineman's rope on my harness, even if it's not attached. So then I threw that around and I was double connected. So I could have slid down the tree that way. Would it have been fun or pretty? No. Yeah. But I would well, your, your climber would have been there for 20 years too. You'd never get that one back. Yeah. Exactly. I'd have to bring another one in and uh-huh. climb up and get uh, it. I'd leave it at that point. <laughs> yeah. Leave it. Nostalgia. Yeah. Yeah. And um, so anyways, I was all shooken up. And at that point, it's daylight and i just was like sitting there you know oh, was, so you were doing this in the pitch black oh yeah <laughs> yeah i was doing the That's pitch even black better. and you know it started raining at that point and i'm like oh, this is miserable i yeah. and then i just turned it to i hate rifle season but <laughs> in reality it was, <laughs> yeah, yeah. it was all my fault and i uh anyways got set up and i was good to go and then um this buck came in right down the edge of the cut in the thick stuff 45 yards i'm like man this is this is perfect this is easy i shoot miss well I, at the point at the time i didn't know i missed and i re-racked another one and he ran off to about 110 yards and he was kind of standing in some brush and again at that point i thought i hit him so i'm like i need to basically keep shooting until he goes down right and i put it on him again held steady squeeze the trigger boom buck flips over he's dead and i'm like all right Climb down the tree and I'm getting my knife ready. I'm, I was, I was going to actually, I was a ways back in. So I was going to pack out the deer and I was like, man, this is great. You know, I'm going to quarter it up and get it out of here. I go up and there was no deer laying there and there was like, you can see the skid marks and stuff. And I'm like, you gotta be kidding me. I never even saw him, you know, get up. And so I started following the, the blood trail and expecting to, you know, catch him bedded or something just slowly. I followed it for over two miles because it was snow so I could track him. And from the looks of it, he stopped bleeding pretty quick and it was only in his right track. So I think I must have hit him in the leg or in the mm. brisket and the blood was running down. And so, I mean, that's absolutely terrible. To, I don't yeah. want to lose a deer in any way, shape or form. Um, but the one thing I, I can almost say for certain is the deer is going to be fine. Mm-hmm. Like, I mean, he wasn't mortally wounded They're in tough. any way so yeah he'll he'll be okay well, but at least he's got food now too they cut all those trees down he's yeah. got all the buds all the treetops to eat on so he yep. should recover yeah so i i think he'll he'll be fine and but anyways that that was kind of my opening day in the rain and you know at that point i took off all my rain gear that i had on and everything and it was just because i was you know hot when i was tracking them so i was soaking wet at that point and and uh it, yeah it was kind of a kind of a miserable day there i guess from my standpoint but i actually had a very similar situation happen to me last year and it wasn't on opening day but we last were last saturday i think oh the last saturday yeah, of rifle season saturday. i see yeah in 2017 and marta and i were actually hunting together and we were sitting on the ground because we didn't have a double or you know like a double stand hung so we found this nice bowl and we just kind of sat on the edge of it and I wasn't expecting anything to happen but you know 30 minutes after sunrise a buck walked past and I took a shot at him freehand but he was probably only 70 yards away and it hit him he immediately spun around and there was not to be graphic, but I'm sure your listeners, you know, are hunters and yeah. probably understand this. There was blood all the way down the his front leg, like completely covered. I had never seen a deer so covered in blood after a shot. And he looked very sick. Like you could just tell, you know, when you see a deer kind of moving back and forth and looking like he's about to fall over. And we immediately started 
celebrating in a way. I was like sort of gasping mm-hmm. for breath, like, Marta, oh my gosh, I can't believe that you're here and that you, like, we just witnessed this together. This is amazing. Like, I just killed a buck. And that would have been my first whitetail that I ever killed. And we, you know, sort of let everybody know. I don't know if we actually saw him fall or if, like, we, what happened. But he was so sick, it looked like he was about to fall. Yeah, he stumbled a little bit. And that's what I said. I said, he's going to lay down right there. Yeah. And we were both so certain. And we let everyone know and we wait about 30 minutes for everyone to come in. It was like, it was a big deal. It would have been the first deer shot at our new camp. And we go to track the blood and there was a lot of blood and no deer. And he ran into some thick laurels and he just got away. And the shot had to have been forward and just didn't hit any vital organs and just hit something that made him bleed a lot. And that was it. Yeah. And at the time, I was so certain that he had to have died. And so we went out looking the next day, the next morning. There was like fresh snow and we never found anything. Mm -hmm. And now in hindsight, and Nick said this from the second that we started tracking, that the deer was fine and he made it and that he you know, would be okay. But I was I like, no. We might, I was like, we might have got him on camera too. I know. It's unconfirmed. And actually, Marta, I need to show you it because she, Marta will know because she saw him too. Mm-hmm. Um, but he was a very unique buck. He had, on his right side, he had a very, like, distinct, thick main beam and one other point. So he was a, a two by something, I think a two by three, but it was so... Like, like heavy, like... Yeah, like something had happened to him that, you know, weren't allowing his antlers to grow properly. Like yeah. He was injured in a fight or whatever it may have been. But he was a very distinct looking mm-hmm. buck. So. I'd seen him the night before and I had already tagged out in archery season and I was sitting maybe 300 yards away from they were, from where they were. And I was just doe hunting and I saw just a huge body come in like right before dark threw my scope up. It's like, oh, he's got antlers. Okay, whatever. He's he's going to walk. That's awesome. Cool encounter. And I saw his right side and I was like, I don't know what's going on there, but he's funky and he's huge. He just had a big, long, like sweeping out wide main beam and just one big point, just a dagger on top. Huh. And on the left side, he had, you know, just probably was a typical eight frame, okay. eight point frame, yeah. but mm-hmm. his right side was just funky. And the next morning they went out and he cruised right through that same line and she got a shot but yeah you know, it is what it is now yeah yeah that's uh that's it's unfortunate but i mean sometimes that does again unfortunately happen totally and it's part of hunting yeah and, and the thing is i'm so far removed from rifle hunting so this is the first time i've rifle hunted with the rifle in my own hand since i don't know 2011 or so and and i had tagged out in archery up into this point and I don't know much about the rounds. And now when I was talking to people, they're like, you're shooting a fast gun with maybe a little uh, bit low, you know, you low know, the, trajectory. Yeah. And then the, and the grains too, like I'm shooting 130 grains yeah. and it all depends on, you know, the, the caliber and stuff. And I'll, I'm probably sounding really stupid to, to rifle guys right we're now. We're the same way, dude. I mean, but, we're, we're bow people Yeah, for and the I, most part. And yeah, it's and, stupid to differentiate like that because we do rifle hunt and we should know. Yeah, oh, yeah, probably a little I'm more a, than we do, but I'm a hunter that's hunting anything that's in season. Yeah, so. <laughs> but I guess yeah. we put the least amount of attention into the kind of round we're shooting. Yes, yep. So that's where we're the least educated, the most ignorant, if you, if yeah. you like to say that. And and like so, like the 270 short mag round I'm shooting is a really good round. It's just like the bullets that I chose to shoot, and at, there's there's a lot of things that go into it, but. Mm-hmm. Anyways, when he's in the brush and stuff, that could have deflected it. There's, you know, I, oh, yeah. I was talking to a guy today, and he was like, "Oh, you hit with that fast of a round that you're mm-hmm. shooting." He goes, "The any sort of brush can throw that off quite a bit, you know, and and that could definitely hit the shoulder, or yeah. whatever." So, because I was like, I held it right on, and you know, I was target shooting two days before that, and I was shooting good, but. You know, there's there's a million things that could go into adrenaline. It. I mean, you're looking yeah. through a high powered scope. Yeah, you know, you're not looking through your bow sight. 
Yeah. Looking through your bow sight, it's even th- even tough to see brush, but with the scope, it's yeah, exactly. You, know, you get thrown off big time. And I I was uh I was laughing at first because I'm like I, I missed it 45 yards. I'm like I can make that shot with my bow. <laughs> and, yeah. And here I am with a rifle, and I, maybe I was too confident thinking, oh, I got a rifle, I can, you know, and, and big buck. Yeah, it's, big buck. Yeah, it was a real nice buck. Yeah. I'll show you guys a picture after this. I I took it um, on Thanksgiving when I saw him through my binoculars. I put my phone up to it mm-hmm. and oh, took cool. a photo of him. So he's mm-hmm. fake phone scope style. Yeah, I yeah. have a phone scope, but I got a new phone now, so it doesn't uh-huh. work for it. Mm-hmm. But. Um, yeah. Anyway, so that was that was kind of the the first day of rifle season, you know, f- for me. But and you guys said you're relatively new to coming to the big woods here, or have you done it before? Uh, I've been coming up here for maybe six, seven years now. Okay. I, I killed that bear up here, um, maybe ten miles from where our new camp is. Uh, I've n- never shot a buck up here. I've been wanting to for many, many years. Um, but yeah, I've never had a place to sleep. So, yeah, you know, we come up here for bear camp. I was lucky enough to shoot a bear and eat it and celebrate and have a big party. And I wish to do that every year, but they're not easy to find, obviously. Yeah. I've, I've never killed a bear up yeah. here and I just started really bear hunting a couple of years ago, but I, I've never killed It's a different, man. Up. People go crazy about it here. Mm-hmm. Crazy. I mean, they're. Compared to opening day buck, there are 10 times as many people in the woods for yeah. bear. That, that's interesting. Bear yeah. also only lasts a week. Four days, I think. Yeah. Oh, even less yeah, than. I think it's Saturday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. Yep. Yep, that's exactly right. Yeah, people go nuts for it. They go nuts for it. Yeah. What about you, Allie? Have you come up here before to hunt? Or is- no. So last year was my first year up here. And I... My journey into hunting is a little bit wonky. Like I have adult onset of hunting. I didn't grow up in a hunting family and I was introduced to it through Nick, through actually his uncle who taught him. And for the first couple seasons, I would just tag along with Nick. And that was just like uh, very small p- patches of public land around where our parents grew up in the Pittsburgh area. And I moved out to Idaho almost immediately after I really started hunting. Like I bought my first compound bow in February of 2015. And by that August, I had a job with First Light and was already at, like I spent my first compound bow season hunting in Idaho. So I hunted out there for three, four years, and now I'm just learning, you know, the areas in Pennsylvania that I had never explored before. Interesting, yeah, yeah. That's so kind, of, yeah, kind of an ass backwards way of getting into it from a typical, oh, absolutely, you know, Pennsylvania yeah. hunter, you know, totally, yeah, yeah. And the buck that I had killed on Monday is the the first buck that we've killed here. Nick had a doe last year. Um, so we have two deer so far from camp. That's awesome. Well, and Rossi. Rossi killed one oh, on uh, Three deer. Tuesday night? Was yeah. It Tuesday night? It was Tuesday really night. nice. Really nice eight point. Huge body. Which I'm going to have to share the photo because yeah. he does have a rut stash in the he photo does. and it, it needs to be shared because it's, it's a pretty it's sick. Epic. Yeah, it's pretty gnarly looking. It's too good not well, to he had Well, he had the Fu Manchu the night before and his little motto was hell yes brother <laughs> <laughs> that's a lot he he many um, drunken snapchats on, uh, <laughs> to people that night like super troopers you know yeah, yeah the movie he was like throwing all kinds of quotes out like that that's like funny. he was farva oh it was funny that's great <laughs> what about you marta how did how did you kind of get into hunting um it's the same kind of thing as Allie. it's kind of an ass backwards way so she got into it because of nick and i kind of got into it because of her so I really, for the first couple of seasons, just tagged along. I went to Idaho a few times and tagged along. Yeah, she's been and on then, bear hunts with us in Idaho. Yeah, we bear wow, hunted. Wow, you got first time. She packed out our mule deer. Yeah, the first yeah. time they both shot Those their mule deer, two mule deer, deer in we, 2015. Oh, nice. We shot them the same day, just a couple hours apart, and Marta was there for I that. Was there. So I didn't carry a weapon and I didn't have a license, but I always tagged along. And then the first time they shot their deer, I was like, I really enjoy this and I could yeah. do this. Also, so I think two years ago was the first time I got my license, and then I've carried ever since, but I haven't killed anything yet. 
Yeah. But tomorrow. Yeah, tomorrow. Tomorrow's the day. Tomorrow's yeah. the day. That's the way it works. And the, I know it is. <laughs> the listeners have heard me say this since uh, September 1st when I started elk hunting. Every day that I've recorded the podcast when I'm hunting next day, I'm like 100% chance. It's, it's going down. By the time you hear this, I already have an elk on the ground. Love I already it. have a deer on the ground. Back been, straps are gone. Yeah. yeah. And, <laughs> and like I've also said, which I'm getting a lot of backlash on, was I said, if you grow a rut stash, your success rate goes up. 38.2 percent and i mean that's science, science. but you know science. and statistically significant obviously yeah. that hasn't worked out for me but you know i fell in the other you know what i i can't do math here 61.8 percent of the sounds good to me yeah I, no one check that because i'm not sure if it's right but uh, <laughs> i'm anyways. going i can't do a stash so i'm doing soul patch <laughs> Oh. Hey. oh man, oh. I have no stash oh. that could be just as creepy as if you want it to be probably know? even worse yeah <laughs> Yeah, you just got to be careful because, like, you, you grow a rut stash and you're not allowed around playgrounds, schools, oh anything else. You so. know, oh. do you know um, Ryan Callahan? Yeah, he's he has a mustache. He's known for his mustache. Yep, his passport photo is such a classic. Like, he could be listed as a pedophile kind of. Photo. Yeah. So it's, it's funny you brought him up because when I was at the Total Archery Challenge, everyone kept coming up to me. They're like. It's like, you look like somebody with that mustache, like it's Ryan Callahan. And uh, I was actually going to send him one of these rustache shirts, and I, I still probably will. Yes. Oh, you but, should. And uh, just just out of the blue, kind of send it to him. Cause Get a I, good laugh out of it. I, I don't know if you guys know Cody Rich from the Rich yeah. Outdoors podcast. Oh, oh, he's got a great stash. So I, I sent yeah. him one, and he sent me a message. He's like, dude, this, he goes, this thing's epic. He's <laughs> like, I got it. He goes, when I remember, he goes, I'll get a picture with it and, and send it to you, but... It was, it was kind of funny, but, um, anyways, now that we're, let's get off the topic of the rut stash back to, <laughs> let's, I kind of want to get your guys' background and who you are a little bit since I didn't, uh, ask that from the beginning. If Nick, if you want to kind of start off here a little yeah, bit. Sure. I grew up just outside of Pittsburgh, um, maybe 12 miles east in a little town, Oakmont fun, uh, Fun childhood, played sports, didn't hunt, didn't know anything about it, didn't really care to, wasn't interested, Um, got a scholarship to play baseball in college, didn't work out, got hurt a bunch of times, and a bunch of different other silly stuff that I won't get into, but nothing bad, just, you know, weird things that go on in life. Uh, decided to start hunting. My uncle got me interested. He said, now that you're not playing ball anymore, you got some free time. Let's go in the woods. So sure, let's do it. I need a new hobby. Can't play ball anymore. Uh, picked up a bow, started archery hunting, fell in love with that almost immediately. Killed a doe, butchered it, ate it. It's phenomenal. I mean, it was, it filled the void. Um, yeah, ever since then we uh, we've been in Idaho, a little bit in Ohio, a little bit in Pennsylvania, obviously, because this is where we're from. And yeah, it's grown from there. I uh, I have two degrees, both from the University of Pittsburgh, both in health and fitness, a masters, a bachelor's and a master's. Was a personal trainer for a while. Wanted to be a strength and conditioning coach. I thought I wanted to be a strength and conditioning coach. I, you know, it turns out I, I didn't really love it as much as I thought I did. I like it for myself, but I, uh, I, don't, I didn't think I wanted to pursue the coaching route. So it was about at that point when we moved to Idaho. Allie got the internship at First Light. I got a full-time job at First Light. I was working at the YMCA and here and there just you know, using my degree and doing, doing what I knew how to do. And, uh, yeah, it's all kind of led into this, this crazy business through social media, social media management, a little bit of marketing and worn and weathered, which gotcha. is our new apparel line. Gotcha. And now it's full time. Awesome. Well, I'm going to, I'm going to dig into some of those things you said there at the end here in a minute, but there's, there's a couple of things I want to ask you. First of all, do you think like, so all three of you here got into hunting late. Do mm-hmm. you think like that had to do with like. The, the passion that grew so quickly and like that you're so passionate about it. Cause it seems like there's a lot of people that I grew up with that have done it since they were, you know, 12 years old. Like, um, you know, a lot of families did in Pennsylvania, especially in the remote area that I grew up in. But 
it, they never like I shouldn't say not all of them, not grouping them in one category, but a lot of them never got into it real seriously. But the friends and people that I've met, like you guys, that got into it late, seem like you're just like yeah, my all brother, into my it. brother's the same way. My brother's been hunting since he was legally allowed to have a license at 10, 11, something yeah, like that. Yeah, 12 years old. And he's... Well, now it's younger, but... Yeah, he loves it. He eats it. He, you know, he puts a decent amount of time into it, but he isn't, for lack of a better word, like, obsessed. I, I, That's my personality, though. Like, I needed something to be, like, full-time. This is what I put my thought and effort into, and that was baseball previously and lifting weights and health and fitness and that's still a big part of my life it always will be but for some reason hunting took that that weird mix of competition and relaxation and self-satisfaction and filled that baseball void and now it's just everything yeah it's our business it's our life it's what we eat it's how we interact it's how we connect with new people it's how we teach other people who want to get into it because we know what it feels like to not know what the hell you're doing or not have a resource Mm -hmm. to be like, Hey, show me like we, we taught ourselves, which is probably part of the reason why we're so intimate with it and why we want to show so many other people because we fell in love with it. Yeah. We fell in love with it partially because of the food, but partially because it's, it's an activity that nobody nobody taught us how to do it we just figured it out and we sucked at it for so long and we're still you know we're not great at it but now we have a little bit of success Mm -hmm. we can at least fill the freezer and that's what makes you keep coming back yeah and like the new you know the new patch of woods that we're hunting we don't have shit figured out but Allie killed a buck opening morning our buddy killed another one the day after and you know, you can at least see a little bit of the, the pieces are starting to fall together. Yeah, some progress. Yeah, as, as a little bit of progress. And, you know, you you don't want to pat yourself on the back or you don't want to pretend like you even have it close to figure it out. But it's pretty cool to see all the hard work come together and, yeah. you know, finally something works out. It's it's one thing, like, when I meet people like all of you, it's they have similar, I guess, personalities that I see in myself with like, I'm, I get extremely obsessed over things. And Mm -hmm. again, for lack of better words is like when I'm doing something, I'm just like 110% into it. And I, I can't think anything else, which is, it can be a fault, but (laughs) I mean, it hurts work. Yeah. Business. You know, I just want to get in the woods. Yeah, no, definitely. And so that's, that's an interesting point. And the other thing, Nick, before I, kind of move along here to get some of the other backgrounds but what's the story behind the hair <laughs> um he's got long flowing locks like a lion's i mane. don't know tell the real story there is a story no i don't want to do that <laughs> <laughs> uh okay, okay. I'll tell it. so i told you about the baseball thing yeah or tell, tell what you can tell you might not be able to tell all of it no i'll, tell I'll, I'll say whatever i don't care <laughs> I don't care now, but me. <laughs> it's embarrassing, slightly embarrassing. So I told you about the baseball thing. It didn't work out in college, partially because I was injured, partially because uh, the team that I was playing for, the program got cut by Title IX, which I don't fully understand, but from what I do understand, it is uh, it protects women's rights, equality. So we had a shit ton more male athletes and male sports than we did women's sports so they decided to cut men's baseball wrestling and golf so instead of adding softball and a women's golf team and uh whatever you know field hockey they just decided to cut them all so it didn't work um i had an itch to keep playing i'm in good shape felt great and i'm lucky enough to have a couple connections here and there i got to play in a league in california a little a winter ball league, let's say. Um, did well, crushed the ball, played a little first, played a little center field, got signed to play with the Washington Wild Things. Got cut out of spring training, which, you know, I just, I wasn't good enough. That's, you know, it is what it is. No big deal. Uh, a guy called me, said there's going to be a baseball movie coming out, like a Paramount picture, Sony picture, whatever, movie coming out. And we saw you in California. And you kind of fit the mold, and we know you can hit, you know, we know you know baseball. Do you have any acting experience? 
I said, actually, it's kind of weird. I, I do have a little bit, um, not in the capacity that you're looking for, but you know, I'd, I'd done it in the past and you know, kind of embellishing a little bit cause I wanted the job. That's pretty cool. Yeah. Right? So he sent me a picture of the, the main character, his hair is long and he's a big burly dude. I tried to put on weight, couldn't put on weight. I'm a skinny guy. That's just the way it is. But what I can do is grow the hair out. <laughs> so I grew the hair out. It's been growing for like a year and a half now. Um, the the talks were getting like kind of serious. Like, hey, you got to fly out and audition. Like it's coming. Like it's it's going. It's going. When can you be here? I'm like, dude, anytime. Just tell me. I'm coming. I'll be at the audition anytime you want. Felt completely fell off the table. Like left them tons of messages, voicemails, just went away. By that time, my hair was like already down to here, you know, like well past my ears. Yeah, yeah. I looked like a fool. I looked like a complete idiot. So fuck it. I might as well keep growing it from there on out. So here we are like a year later. <laughs> yeah, that's <laughs> and I got hair down to my tits, but <laughs> it was only supposed to be about here to my chin. So yeah, there's the full story. That's really funny. Uh-huh. Okay. That's kind of embarrassing. I mean, I'm not like... No, that's... That, great story. No, I think that is good. That's, that's weird. I thought it was going to be worse than that. From no, like, no, it's but great. It, it's embarrassing. You know, like somebody got me. They fooled me. You know? <laughs> yeah. They they tricked me. They got me. They they got me excited. They... Yeah. You know, they hey, got me thinking now you got cool. now you got this big now I got cool hair. Like, you got cool locks. hair. Jokes on you. And I I know what you're talking about like with that awkward length that looks. Like, oh, I, yeah. I was oh. just telling. I just cut all mine off because it was at the point where like people are like, "Are you homeless? Like, what do you like? What's going on with you? Are you okay?" Oh, uh, it was bad for a good mm, six eight months, and yeah. now it's like you know, kind of hits yeah. at the cool length. Yeah, it's <laughs> I can put it in a ponytail. <laughs> I can do all the good stuff. Man bun. Man bun. Yeah. I don't do that. No, <laughs> only around the house. No, not even. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, um, that's hilarious. The there goes Allie just throwing you under the bus like that. Oh. Bullshit. <laughs> uh, Allie, you had uh, given a little bit of your background as far as how you got into hunting. Is there anything else mm-hmm. that kind of you want to add? And even like with how you got started with your Outdoors Alley brand, if you kind of want to get into that. Yeah. So I, uh, oh, where to start? In high school. I had taken a anatomy and physiology class and absolutely loved it. I was in 10th grade and it was a class with mostly juniors and seniors. And I was always intelligent. Oh, nice. Hear that? Nice. All right. That's appropriate. <laughs> Sorry, I had to. I'll just keep going. Yeah. <laughs> it- <laughs> <laughs> all right we're back uh had a little bit of a technical difficulty when the beer cracked the batteries died at the same time <laughs> conveniently <laughs> yeah conveniently i i think it was really when marta she put down her headset i think that's what broke it she messed it up. yeah i broke it i ruined it all i think that's what happened but that's what happened but i'm not gonna blame her you know at least <laughs> at least on here publicly but <laughs> gotta blame somebody yeah it kind of sound like it wasn't was it, my fault was it my fault that it sounds a little bit like blame. i didn't do nothing and then all my batteries I went to put in it that I brought with me were just about dead. Uh-huh. And I bought a whole bunch of bulk batteries off eBay. And yeah, there's your first decision. problem. When, yeah. That, so eBay. Nick saved the day. Hurt he had, so had some batteries and that's just the way it was. You know, we, we're back. <laughs> we're back online. And Allie, you were just getting into talking a little bit about yes. yourself. Yeah, about my background. Yeah. So I think I left off at anatomy and physiology class in high school. I had taken this class or this course and loved the human body. I loved learning about it. And I knew from that experience that I wanted to do something in healthcare. And I had set my eye on PA school, which is physician's assistant, did the mic pick that up? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it, might, it might have picked that one up. Oh, man. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> wait, side note, he was smiling the whole time leading up to that. He got Hard giving me story. those eyeballs <laughs> like he was, yeah. was going to let it go. Nick let one rip. Actually, I think that was Marta. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Was definitely Marta. Ricochet off the tile floor. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, you got to stop ruining everything on this podcast. You know? Everything is my fault. <laughs> <laughs> Just blame it all on me. That's funny. Oh, 
Anyways, anatomy Anyways. and physiology again. <laughs> Good old anatomy and phys. Um, I applied to the University of Pittsburgh, got in. They had a phenomenal medical program. Was going through all of the steps that you go through to get into PA school. And my major was emergency medicine. So I was trained to be an EMT and then later on a paramedic. So I started working as a paramedic. And while I was actually going through the process of working in the field, I had one of those moments where you realize that everything that you've been working towards isn't actually what you want to do. It isn't actually what I thought it was going to be. I loved learning about the human body and learning about medicine way more than I liked actually practicing it. And for me, working as a medic, the sort of adrenaline kind of stereotypical picture that you think of uh, when you think of emergency medicine was only about 10% of what that job actually is for the area that I was in. It was just a big, I guess, wake up call that it wasn't what I was passionate about. It would have been fine, but it wasn't it. Um, so that's really like my background and where I came from. And I somehow found my way into this through Nick. And I think it was really like the first time that I was on a hunt with him where he actually killed an animal because there were plenty of hunts that we went on that nothing happened. And it's probably because I put like too much perfume on and I was like giggling and talking the whole time. And like, you know, I just wanted to hang out with him. I didn't actually want to hunt. Darts. Yeah. Like <laughs> yeah. just having fun outside together. And the one time that it actually did all work out and I saw the breakdown of an animal. And I think anyone who's in medicine can probably relate to this. A lot of hunters could probably relate to this, but just like actually seeing meat broken down from uh, an animal that you saw alive a couple minutes earlier is really significant. It's really eye-opening. And that moment really flipped a switch. And I knew that I want, it was something that I wanted to pursue. I actually think that story is a lot like Marta's story. Like whenever we had killed mule deer. Marta was sitting there as we were, she had, she had never seen an animal uh, like field dressed before, butchered before. And we were like skinning the animal out and she was sitting eating a peanut butter and jelly sandwich <laughs> watching us. Like it did not phase her for a second. I think that she just <laughs> immediately understood that that was meat that like you can eat and enjoy. And um, yeah, so that that's my background and I think really where like everything all fell into yeah, place. Well, to maybe. interject for a second, like we, we didn't, we were never like video games on the couch, like indoor people. Like we Absolutely. Had, we were always outdoor like, folks. We'd been fishing for a super, super long time before that. And we always did stuff. We went hiking and we went fishing. So like, we didn't just sit around and do nothing. Like we I were rode always... horses for a long time too. I rode horses for over ten years. I used to show horses. Okay. I loved them growing up, and I still love horses. And one day I hope to have horses. But so I was always involved with the outdoors and yeah. animals. Like we would go camping, hiking, fishing. The only thing we didn't do was hunt because we didn't have nobody open the door for us. And that's like it's really hard to get into it if you don't have somebody who can open the door. Like once the door is open, it, you know, as long as you're safe, mm -hmm. you, yeah. you know how to properly manage a firearm, you know, you're, you're taking control of what you're doing. You can go out and explore. I mean, you can be fine, but to get the door open, that's the hard part. Yeah. yeah I agree with that. Yeah. Even, I think it's interesting because for me, it all started with archery. It was, um, a combination of a love of archery and an interest in this pursuit of meat that was very interesting to me and just the pursuit of the outdoors in general. But I think had I been introduced and it been a firearm at first, it probably would have been a bit harder for me to come around to that idea. 
And I think my introduction into firearms was then through hunting. So for me, it went kind of like archery hunting firearms. And now I'm, you know, I own firearms. I I hunt with firearms. Yeah. But, um, yeah, that that is an interesting way to get introduced to it. Mm. But that's not to say if you weren't like an always typically indoors kind of person that you still can't get out there and enjoy it. I mean, of course you can. Yeah. There's, there's plenty of people who do that. It just helped you guys. Absolutely. Yeah. It made it easier because I think we were always like slightly interested, but, mm-hmm. you know, maybe just uncomfortable with doing it ourselves. And yeah. as soon as somebody was like, hey, let me show you. I was like, oh my God, really? All right, here we go. Yeah. And now it's kind of cool because a lot of the people who taught me a few things here and there, now they're like, hey, like they want my advice. They're like, well, what do you think about this? Well, how about if I try this? How about if I try that? And so now they, they kind of lean on me for advice, you know, when in turn they were the ones who really brought me into it. Yeah. And then you just kind of ran with it. Yeah. <laughs> now I'm just oh, yeah. full tilt. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, and so how did that kind of lead into what you did with Outdoors Alley and everything else there? Cause yeah. I mean, that's, I mean, that's how I originally found you guys was through your Instagram page and everything else. And so can you kind of get into that a little bit? Absolutely. It was definitely the archery thing that started that. Marta and I, it's so fitting that you're here because you were such a part (laughs) of all of it too. Marta and I both bought our first compound bow. I had just hunted that previous season with a crossbow And I didn't kill anything, but I knew that I wanted to take it to the next level because I had this interest in archery. So we both bought compound bows and we shot all summer long. Like practically every day we would go over to each other's houses and just shoot in the backyard. And I think that I think about this in two ways. I think it was partially to find other people who are interested in the same thing because I was not active on social media. I had an Instagram that I would occasionally post on, but like my friends used to tag me on Twitter, like hashtag Twitterless Alley. That was like the thing because I didn't actually have a lot of social media. Um, So I think part of it was to find people who are interested in archery and hunting. And part of it was this opportunity to potentially build some kind of a business in something that I was into like that search for a passion it was all around the same time when I was falling out of love with medicine and looking for something that I really enjoyed so it was July of 2015 and we had been shooting every day and so I had a ton of content because I was always shooting my bow with Marta or in the woods like trying to hang a a trail camera and not really knowing like if I was putting it in the right spot or not and just trying to figure things out and really openly and honestly sharing that process and the process that continues to happen just learning how to do it all yeah um shamelessly and that's really what started it and then I had moved to Idaho in September and I think hunting in Idaho taught me that I love adventure. So I think uh, like my whole love of hunting also like opened the door to just my love of exploring, just to like be outside and find new things and to sleep under the stars and like uh, that whole experience. Yeah. Gotcha. So that, and it's, it's so crazy to me. I think it's awesome. Like how something like social media can, honestly end up turning into something that's a business or you know like there's it's 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 so cool to me like any it's i think it's easier now it's not easy but i mean it's easier now to put yourself out there with those type of things and be able to connect with like-minded people Mm. than ever before i mean that's i've got to meet so many awesome people through it and Mm. that through social media and and everything else and it's just from sharing the things that I liked and then finding things that other people were into the same stuff or trying to learn the same things. Yeah. And it's, it's really cool. I totally agree with that. It's, yeah. it's crazy to think. Um, so Nick and I had lived on the road for the past five ish months, the summer into the fall. 
And the biggest takeaway that I had from that experience was how many friends we have in states all across the country. There were so many people who we had met through social media that are really wonderful, fantastic, amazing people whom we were able to spend time with, like really good quality time with in person because we were living on the road. But it was all through social media. Yeah, yeah that's what we're doing right now. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> really. Right I mean, I just invited you up here Saturday. I hope you can come. Yeah, yeah. I come know. Up, like no no headphones, no cameras, nothing. Come hang out. Yeah. You know, be you, you don't want to wear podcast equipment while we're hunting. I mean, we could do that, you know. You never know. <laughs> <laughs> you never know. Turkey hunting might be okay. I don't know about whitetail. But. Yeah, no, I'm just kidding. As we talked about with the whole filming while hunting thing. Oh, well, half man. the time, some of the people we hang out with, you might as well have a headphone on because it's, no. No. hey, where are you? Yeah. <laughs> like, shut up, dude. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> and and then Marta, you kind of joined in on this whole journey it's the same time as Allie then? Yeah, it was the same time as Allie. So I actually grew up right down the street from Nick and I've known him forever. And then I met Allie in about 11th grade and we had been friends ever since. And then when she picked up archery, the first time I ever, I couldn't shoot her bow at first. It was too... I have a longer draw length. It was a longer draw length and it was heavy and it's a completely different set of muscles. But I tried that whole entire day and once I finally got it, I was like, I love this. I yeah. need my own. Oh my God. And we had bruises the size of... Oh my like, gosh, I know. Because we didn't know how to shoot at oh, all. Oh, on your forearm. Oh yeah. yeah. The we like tried. dollar sized <laughs> bruise on our forearms. And then she moved to Idaho and I had to go visit her. I said, I'm up for this adventure. I have to go. I have to join. And I did. And it was so much fun ever yeah. since then. And I've loved it too. Isn't it awesome? Like just, just taking chances like that and going out. Like, I mean, like you said, you didn't really have a hunting background and no. just when you get opportunities like that, just seizing them, you know, and yeah. doing whatever possible to, to make it happen. Then it, you know, and, and it may sound dramatic, but it can be life changing from doing those type of things. Oh, for sure. It's amazing. Yeah, absolutely. It's so How about if we flip the scripts here? So, like, as somebody who didn't grow up hunting, like, all three of us, besides you, mm -hmm. was this always, like, your thing, or was it football? Ah, like, yeah. at some point, was it football and girls, or was it always just like this? <laughs> like, this was it. You know, like, I mean, of course, there had to be something. <laughs> yeah. So, like, for me, I mean, I, I grew up, I mean, in a big hunting family, mostly archery, but all hunting, and from a young age, and I was into it when all my friends really weren't you know, in, in high mm -hmm. school and everything. Oh, that had weren't. to be hard. Yeah, it was. And I like, I'd, you know, come into school with my, my picture, my buck I got on the first day or whatever. And I'd come in and show everybody and they're like, oh, that's cool. You know? uh -huh. Whatever. And everyone thinks, you know, coming from a rural area that everybody hunts, but not as many people get into it. And, and I played sports and, and, and everything, but I could, I never got like fully engulfed into it like I would it became hunting season like I didn't play football my senior year in, in high school because I was like I got so into archery hunting at that yeah. point I was like screw this yeah. I'm not doing that I want to archery hunt and then got into college and like the first year I didn't know where to hunt near there or anything and and then you know obsessions with other things took over you know women and, and a little and, <laughs> and, and you know light. yeah and partying a little bit and yeah, so there's a lot of things there that took me off track for a while. But it was your way. main course since you were 16. Yeah, yeah, and yeah, yeah and and so I, I'd killed my first buck when I was was 17, senior year in high school, and it's actually I think it still might be my biggest Pennsylvania deer, my oldest one at least, mm. aged eight and a half years old, real old deer, oh, yeah. my first archery kill, and I missed like three deer before that. Everyone always called me growing up the lucky kid because. Every year they'd be like, I I would kill a nice buck, not because of me, because my dad would put me in these places, mm -hmm. and they'd be like, oh, you'll never get one, you know, bigger than that, or you might only get one opportunity of the year, and there's me just flinging arrows because I didn't, I just didn't know any better, yeah. and and uh, too dumb to know better. Yeah, just keep trying. Yeah, I just kept doing it, and I was getting so frustrated, and and uh, then in college I got to meet some of my who are still some of my best friends today. And they were from all over, someone from Wexford down by Pittsburgh. And, and they all played football at Slippery Rock. But uh, on Mondays were the day off. And we'd all go hunting together. And 
we get deer and we go to to one guy's house who rented a farmhouse and we cut up the deer and do everything together and that kind of got me back mm -hmm. into it and we started a uh it was like a a brand within just all of us we call it the compound cowboys like i made a logo and we had this we got patches that we sewed we had our mom sew on to our hats and like it was it was just funny how that all kind of you know took off there but for me that was mostly my passion i i did like not to the level that you did with, you know, health and fitness, but I really had gotten into working out and lifting weights. And I used to be into like, I used to weigh a lot more. Than I do now. Cause I was into like, Oh, trying to body build and do that yeah, kind of fun. stuff. And it, it's, it's, and it's, it's awesome. It was awesome. And, but then I got back into hunting and started, I took all that stuff that I loved and molded it into it. So like, I still love working out and doing everything, but I just do it in a different fashion now Yeah, that's no, geared understand. towards hunting and everything else. So that's kind of, that's, I'm, I'm glad you, you know, to ask that question because it's, you know, being yeah. the host most times, I just, I'm the one asking the question. No, honestly, that. most of the people who will be here on Saturday are adult, adult on, onset, adult onset hunt, like, baseball ex-baseball players ex yeah football players just guys who we all grew up doing the same thing never hunted always fished like i said before always fished always we're in the woods doing something even if it was just making a fire and drinking beer we were in the woods mm -hmm. like we were doing something outside but none of us knew how to hunt and so yeah most of the people who will be here on saturday don't have an extensive background growing up it's not much of a family tradition we're kind of first generation here so it's different to have somebody like you who's yeah. maybe a fourth generation Pennsylvania hunter. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And and that's like, I mean, I grew up from my, well, my dad and my, my grandfather and stuff. My, my, my grandpa started with traditional equipment, archery when archery, no one did it, you know, and, and he was you know, killing deer and, and everything. And I got to grow up around that and seeing it. So like, there's a yeah. bunch of photos of me and up in camp when I was like a little baby, you know, up next to my dad with his buck and yeah. in the back of the tailgate, you know, the typical. Oh, yeah. yeah. No, that's Classic. cool. I, I like in a weird way, envy that, you know, I like, yeah, I wish that I had those classic memories. We don't. And you know, whatever we, we still have fun and we taught ourselves and thank God it was now as opposed to 20 years from now so we can still make our own memories and you know teach the people that we're with and help the people that want to come up here and do it but yeah i envy that that, that you've had grandparents and fathers and father-in-laws and cousins every, yeah. everybody we just I, like i said my uncle no did father-in-laws whatever i'm not married i don't know <laughs> i just met you an hour ago <laughs> i was only married twice <laughs> <laughs> just assuming yeah no it's <laughs> no but i i get what you're saying and it it was really cool doing that and like so you guys have this camp you know what two and a half hours from where you grew up yeah my camp is literally like 200 yards from my house yeah <laughs> like that's and everyone's like how feeling. do you have a camp when you live like up there i'm like that's just i don't it's know the way it is it's on the back of my grandfather's property and my uncle lives out front and like we all live on one road and it's it's just it's, it's interesting neat. yeah it's it is neat. And it's probably a lot of cool stories. Yeah. Oh, there's, there's a lot, there's a lot of cool stories. There's a lot of stories that you better put your muck boots on because it's going to be deep when the, <laughs> when the stories start talking, but Dude, <laughs> it's just the way it is up here. We talk to the neighbors and you go to the local bar. It's like, man, you guys have seen some stuff up here. It's changed. <laughs> yeah. It's changed. Yeah, for, it has changed. You know, maybe for the better, honestly, because I feel like a lot more people are either more educated or ready to be educated on the rules. Yeah. Honestly, because there's, it seems like there used to be a lot of like backcountry lawlessness here. And now the deer numbers are going up. The turkey numbers are going up. The bear numbers are going up and people want to do it right. Yeah. It's not, you know, it's in the books now. Yeah. And, that, and I feel like a lot of people are on board with it. So maybe it did change for the better and some people might disagree, but yeah, at least the way I see it, it seems like it's all, it's going pretty well and people welcome us. Yeah, no, that's, that's great. I mean, and it's funny cause like I remember when I was a kid, I'd always hear, Oh, the Pittsburgh hunters come up, you know, exactly, and that, yeah. that type of thing. The and Pittsburgh now it's boys like, you know, yeah. shit's going to go down up yeah. here, but no, we're, yeah, we're just, just trying to hang out and have fun and find our own little slice of heaven. Yeah. We were hunting out in Utah earlier this year with a couple of friends and they told a story of some like Pittsburgh hunters that came out I think we they we had hunted private land one day 
and they had like hosted other people before something like that. And they had a group of Pittsburghers that came out and they <laughs> just said group of Yenzers. Yeah. They just <laughs> they just had a whole story about like the I it was very specifically like the Pittsburgh Hunters. Yeah. Which I, I can't town. I can't I mean, relate to or really understand because I don't you know, I haven't been part of the culture yeah. of that as much as you know Well you've been to the the culture of football and partying, like you know how the general hard working Tough. Oh, totally. You know, that's just like you know. That's what comes oh, across. That's how, okay. You're and it's, describing it's, a yinzer. Yeah, it's translated. Football yeah. partying. Full football partying. Full tough, orange hard. jumpsuits. That's it all I, I remember. Pumpkin suit. Yeah, oh, I wore mine for good luck. Oh, he did. did. <laughs> see, that's that's <laughs> didn't uh, see anything. I had to try. <laughs> you had to. Yeah. Do you wear that don ton? <laughs> I'm not familiar. <laughs> yeah, Explain. I, I was. I was. No, I just always laugh about. Um, how like some of the people from Pittsburgh have like such a hard accent. Uh, Don, uh, Don uh, Ton. Oh my god. John Eagle. Dan Tan, not Don Ton. Oh, Don Ton. I, I thought you were trying to say wonton. <laughs> yeah. I, Don Ton. I thought you were talking about like a hat or something. <laughs> no. <laughs> but uh, yeah, we Oh, the accent's real. It's, it's a obnoxious. real thing. It's yeah. Obnoxious. I it's, have a couple aunts and uncles who who yins are hard. They've got this, you know, classic Pittsburgh accent. Mm -hmm. So like my, uh, so my dad's side of the family, my, my grandpa grew up, um, down by Pittsburgh and he is 87 years old and still has it. Like he says things that are slippy and like different, like little words that you could tell that. Yeah. There's a lot of them and you don't even recognize them until you go away and you might have a little bit, there might be a little bit that like Mm -hmm. slips in here and there and people are like, can you, can you say that again? (laughs) Yeah, because really? mine's not even bad. Like you should hear some of my friends. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> mine's. Everyone says I have a Canadian accent. Yeah, Maybe a little. you know what? Um, There's a different we, one up here for yeah, sure. Yeah, we have a couple friends from like the State College area mm-hmm. who actually now live in Montana, but they definitely have a very similar inflection as you do. Like a, it's it's kind of Canadian. <laughs> it's kind. Of, it's a little just, more New York. Just a. Yeah. Little buffalo, little buffalo, a little buffalo. I didn't know there was a buffalo. It's a, it's a little it's a buffalo. Thing. Oh, buffalo's got one for sure. I had a roommate who was from Buffalo, and it's similar to yours. Similar. Yeah. Huh. I'm gonna have to look that up. Yeah. yeah. Find, <laughs> find a buffalo native and have him talk to me. Uh-huh. On have a cup of coffee. Actually, Nikki's from Buffalo. I don't think she has much of an accent. It's something you can like. Obviously, we're from. We're three of us are from Pittsburgh. It's something that you can consciously i see in the area consciously like kind of get rid of if yeah if it's, if it's deemed oh, yeah. if you deem it unattractive you can i do at least yeah yeah i consciously try to stay away from see, sorry to I, all the I, speaking, <laughs> yeah i pick up on accents like in if I'm around someone enough, I start talking like that. Oh, even, like I'm absolutely. real bad with it. Like I, I remember I'd come home and everyone's was like, you sound like you're from Pittsburgh. I'd, I'd say things yeah. and I, I, and I do it like jokingly, but I'd make fun of like the word so much that I started saying yeah. it that yeah. way. <laughs> and, uh, it was just, it was funny. We yeah. get it up here when we say going up camp, like we're going up to camp. Like from up here, up, you from up here going up camp. It's like, <laughs> That's a Pittsburgh thing because Pittsburghers go up north yeah. to camp. So I get that up here. But that, I, that's the only Pittsburgh thing that I and, get at least get poked fun at. And that's and I even say now up north. So like that's just where I grew up. I never called it up north. And everyone like exactly. was down there, <laughs> down there. Damn. And uh, they'd be like, they'd be like, oh, oh, you hunting up north? You know, bow hunts up north. And I'm like. It's just like, uh, I don't know. And up in the mountains, like we know, and I, I do it bad now. Like, you know, I call, you know, call hunting up here, hunting mountain bucks where we never call mountains up here. We never, it's just, this is yeah, where yeah, we hunt. Yeah. You, you know, know what I, I picked up on earlier is I hear a lot of people refer to this as the big woods. Yeah. It's just a thing. Uh, you, you guys say it. Yep. It just, yeah, it makes I sense. Never I never mean, heard way, that or way said bigger. that before. Really? But I like that description It's very of it. literal. Yeah. I like it. Yeah. But yeah. Nobody, nobody at home in Pittsburgh says the big woods. It's just mm-hmm. up at camp, mm-hmm. but you guys refer to it as the big woods, yeah. which makes sense. I mean, yeah, you can go forever. So actually it's a little bit of a sidetrack, but I was up here 
<laughs> up here. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> what year I've been go? off on you. Yeah. <laughs> um, I was in Warren uh, a few weeks ago recording a podcast with a couple guys. They're they have a company called Wild at Heart Outdoors. Oh yeah, we watched our YouTube videos. Yeah, they're good. They're, they're kick ass. They're really good. Really good. And I met up with them. Just I just reached out to them. Was like, hey guys, like I I watched your videos and I was like that 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 re sparked me being proud of kind of where I came from and this style of hunting and everything. And I went up and recorded with them and they were such a cool group of guys. I mean, they don't live far from here at all. And, um, yeah. So like it, it, it was funny. We were just talking about like, you know, the big woods style of hunting and mm-hmm. everything else. And oh, it's different. Did, did you get a chance to hunt in Allegheny County at all when you worked in the bow shop? I did not, not when I was at the bow shop, but in college, I went down in the Wexford area and hunted with one of my roommates from college. It's different. It's very different. It's different. It's, different. it's cool. Um, and then when I was down at the bow shop, the, the man store manager there, Rick, he, uh, he killed a really good deer last year on a small piece of property and I helped him go get it. And it was so weird, like going down into the yard next to a swing set. Yeah. Like behind yeah. the house, like literally we drug the deer 40 yards to the back of the yard. Like it, and it was just giant deer. Like it was, it was just mm-hmm. like so different and each experience is cool. And that's why I think white tails are so, I'm so engulfed with just whitetails in general because they live in so many cool places. Like I've gotten into trying to hunt them in swamps and, and, you know, farm country and suburbs and the mountains and the big woods and everything else that you can do. I mean, I'm, I'm going to try to hunt them next year, actually in Idaho, hunt whitetails. Too. Oh man, so, I've been wanting to do that. We've been talking about that for years, yeah. years. So I think, I think that may happen next year. And, um, but, but anyways, it's just cool how they live in so many awesome places. Yeah. If you can, wherever you are, if you can take it for what it is, like this is just where they are and this is what they do. And if you take the time to figure it out and hunt it for what it is, mm-hmm. it's, it's a very unique experience in and of itself. Yeah. And we've fallen into that trap coming out of Idaho where we're like six miles into the back country and you can't even hear an airplane fly by cause there's nothing, but you go to hunt whitetails in the city. I mean, not in the city, in the suburbs of Pittsburgh where you're hearing car alarms go off. You can hear the garbage trucks come by. It's, it's distracting. And, uh, if you're not used to it, it can be m- maybe even slightly off putting, but if you can remove yourself from that and just take it for what it is, as a unique experience, it's for me. It's awesome. Yeah, I like it. I think it's super, super cool because they catch on to you. I mean, they they know what's going on. They're not stupid, yeah. and they'll figure you out. You can walk into the same four acre patch every day. They're not walking by you. There's twenty deer in there. They're not walking by you. And and that's and that's what I say. Like it's not, it's not any harder hunting them in any different place. It's different. It's just you have exactly. to figure it out differently, you know, and yeah. that's yeah. that's what's so cool about it and, and why I think I'll never lose this obsession. You know, as much as I go west hunting elk and everything else, like I love it, but whitetails still have a special place in my heart for I it. I will know? say whitetails are taking over a lot of habitat that mule deer need. So in a lot of places in the west where there are whitetail, that natively speaking weren't there, it's an issue. And I think that's why a lot of folks in those areas don't look at whitetail the same way because to them, they're pushing out the animals that should be there. And they make it a hell of a lot harder for mule deer to thrive and survive the way they should. Like mule deer numbers statistically in a lot of areas are down. And it's not just because of like habitat loss because whitetail are sort of taken over, you know, there's human impact and a million other things that are going on as well. Um, but I think like what Nick was speaking to here with that kind of like urban whitetail hunting, it took me a while to really come around to that, but I really enjoy it. And I think that there's a lot of just new experiences to gain and learn from that. But yeah, the the Western whitetail thing is definitely like a a topic of debate to people. I think I think it's it can be viewed a lot of different ways. That's that's an interesting point because I I always wondered that I'm like why don't people get excited because like I'll see it again with social media I'll see people killing these giant whitetails in like Idaho and Montana in the mountains and they're not like really super they're looked excited at as about rats it. yeah and 
Yeah. Well, I'll take. I can take care of that. You know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> or try to play to. devil's. Yeah. To play devil's advocate, you could look at it as another valued resource. You know, as long as like what you're saying, it's not destructive to native habitat. You can look at it as another valued resource where people pay a lot of money, a lot of good money to come out there and hunt trophy whitetails. So sure, that I money that, theoretically goes yeah. back into conserving native habitat. But I get what you're saying. Roundabout way. Yeah. I Definitely mean, it, in a roundabout it's, way, but it's similar to like, has value. Um, it's similar to like brook trout, like uh, brook trout are, very adaptable you know brook trout are able to they're just more resilient than other species of trout so like, when there's cold water absolutely yeah but so for like take a a stream that has native cutthroat running through it like brook trout in general they can adapt to those streams and sort of take over in the same way that a white tail may take over an area that a mule deer used to be inhabiting um, and so you're right. And like, I, I, I love catching brook trout wherever I am and I like hunting whitetail wherever I am, but there's, you know, there's definitely some interesting intricacies to the where and how and all of that. Yeah, no, that's, that's, there, there are so many different things with all different species and everything. Yeah. Like oh, you can go back oh, and forth I, all day. I, I, I'm barely scratching the surface myself. Yeah. I feel like I know nothing when it comes to to just native species and where everything should yeah, be. Yeah, ecology and, and biology. It's it's wild. Yeah, it's that could be a timeline podcast too. or a series of podcasts in itself, <laughs> yeah. you know. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> it's out oh, of yeah. my league for sure. Yeah. So w- what I kind of want to shift gears to here a little bit is I want to hear a little bit more about how both of you kind of talked about your backgrounds and how you, you know, went to school for this and that. So what are you doing now and why? We are very busy now. We're both full-time content creators. Um, I hate to use the word influencer, but I use it because it's understandable, like social media influencer and we now own another business, which is Worn and Weathered, which is a lifestyle and apparel brand. So our day-to-day varies from creating content for different sponsors that we're working with. Maybe they they need content for their social media, their website, their catalog, et cetera. Um, creating content for my social media, which is Outdoors Alley. We do Instagram and YouTube and Facebook very poorly, but it's, in, it's, it's all in there. Um, so whether we're filming videos for YouTube or just capturing whatever we naturally want to be doing and sharing that. Um, and then with Worn and Weathered, there's a whole nother slew of daily logistics that go on in terms of just building an apparel brand creating design ideas. We work with a designer to create all of our designs. The fulfillment, we're total like startup out of garage kind of feel. Like we're, we're out of truck. We're out of truck mobile. <laughs> <laughs> we're doing it all. So our hats change very frequently throughout the day. Yeah, that's what it sounds like. But what what's so cool to me and... One of the one of the many reasons that I wanted to talk to to both you and Marta is uh, how how you guys kind of just chase your dreams. Like you just went out there, and I'm sure it was uncomfortable from the fact that like you know that you you guys could have been in steady jobs and with the, the benefits and everything else that you know what people think of as the typical American dream. Mm-hmm. But instead, you took risk and and went out there and did this, and it. It seems to me, at least, that you guys are doing a pretty good job with it. Yeah. It, yeah, I appreciate that. That's more, honestly, that's more her. I'm more, I guess, the safe route. <clears throat> you know, I like I like routine. I like, I like to have a good idea of what's coming next. I like to plan. She's more of like, wing it. Let's, let's go. Let's crush it. So... I give her most most of the credit for that, but you know I do a lot of stuff on the back end. All, obviously, most of the camera work, 
a lot of social media work, but yeah, it's, it's something that I'd five years ago, if you would have said like, this is what you're going to be doing. I'd say, no way. I'm going to be in the weight room at the university of Pittsburgh, coaching football players, how to have a better deadlift, have a better clean and jerk, how to do this and that. But obviously this is what we're doing now. And, and yeah, it's a risk, but it's so rewarding. And from the outside of me, I think that's probably why that you guys work well together with, you know, you might yeah. have the planning. She might be like, all right, let's go do this. This is crazy. Let's go. And, and that might be the right idea, but maybe like, all right, you know, Nick, maybe again, this is from the outside looking in is you might be like, all right, let's, let's look at how we can plan this. That's a great idea. Let's roll with it. But, and then maybe like, you'd be like more reserved on something and she's like, let's, let's roll with it. And then you, you plan it. Yeah. Out it's a give and a take. And, I mean, it's, it works synergistically. It, out, you know? it works. I'd like to think it works the best that it could. And hopefully, yeah. you know, in the future we can hire on some people who are way different than us. You know, somebody who's better analytically, somebody who's maybe an in-house designer. Like, you know, we can have, yeah. we have room to grow. I mean, we're definitely not. If you find that person, can you like contract them out to me? Maybe. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, maybe. <laughs> Because that's that's my weakness. (laughs) Yeah, it's there's so many things that we need help with still. But like I said, when we do it together, you know, it works pretty well. Yeah, at least thus far. Yeah, it's interesting in this lifestyle. You really need to be a jack of all trades. You have to know how to do everything because you're reliant on yourself. Whenever you you're working for yourself and you aren't told what to do you have to create it so there's a lot of things that we have struggled with and then learned from and grown from over you know the past actually technically speaking we have been full-time for just about a year okay like just under a year Mm -hmm. but we've been doing this for like three years you know we've Mm -hmm. ever since i started my instagram We've been working to capture our story, tell stories, like get better at photography, everything that goes into it. Um, and it's a process. Yeah, that's that's what's great about, again, talking to you guys. Because sometimes you feel like you're in your own little world with it. Like I, I've, I've been trying to learn so much and and not to bring it all back on me here, but just like trying to learn cameras. Like I, I love taking photos, but... I didn't know anything about it and I got a DSLR and I'm trying to learn it and take, you know, good photos, creative photos and do this and then, you know, figure out how to run Instagram and how to market it and how to go Mm. through just, it's all such a learning and you have to put so much time into it. And I I think that's something gets overlooked. Like if someone would look at you and be like, Oh, look, look, she got super popular on this and look how, you know, there's a lot of work that goes oh, into that. It looks oh, no so easy from the outside. Had, on your Instagram, we've had 1,600 posts now. It's a lot of posts. Yeah. They're all thoughtful. I mean, they're not just like, selfie, look, I'm sitting they're in the woods. Yeah, sign. Yeah, Hashtag exactly. yay. Uh, and you, I think <laughs> this is episode 38. 36, right? Uh, 37. Well, this one may, I don't know where this is going to be. This will be anywhere from... Th- 39 to 40. It's nice. going to be the next couple Point of weeks. Point yeah. yeah. That's fucking awesome. Yeah. And that's a lot of work, dude. I know it's how much time you put in. Yeah. You, know, you have to edit all this. Every yeah. fart that I had, every burp, every weird <laughs> I'm noise. actually going to amplify that. <laughs> okay, <laughs> fine. Yeah. You know, like, dude, it takes a lot of time. And on top of a full-time job. Yeah. It's yeah, not th- easy. Thank you. And But when you're doing it for yourself, the ambition is there and the drive is high. It's and so you want to get it done and you want it to be high quality. And you're not stuffing somebody else's bank account. You know, you could be working at whatever, some hospital, mm-hmm. some accounting firm. That's great. Somebody's got to do it, of course, and somebody's got to start there and somebody's got to learn those skills. But to take it for yourself and to make it yours, like your name is on this. It's yeah. got to be right. It's got to be 100%. It's funny because like I can you know, go to my full-time job every day and I do, you know, put – everything i can into that of course so you but, wouldn't have been hired yeah exactly and and like but it's it's you know i'm making money for someone else and i understand that's how the the world works and a lot of things but the way my mind works is i'm doing this other thing that you know i'm making you know real, literally next to nothing right now but putting in so much effort into it 
because I see that future that I want to build. You know, I, I, I have that vision of what I want and what I want to see. And, and again, I see that with, with you guys as well is just, if you want it bad enough, you can do it. And I believe that with anything, like you just literally just focus on it and, and it's one, and then I write everything down and what I, where I want to be. And a lot of times I don't know where I want to be. It might change, but if I get something on paper and, you know, force myself to do it. And when you don't want to work on things and like when it comes to writing articles, there's a lot of times I'm like, I don't feel like doing this. I don't feel creative. But once I sit there and start doing it, then things start flowing and you just, yeah. and, and the, the, you know, the passion and everything kind of rolls out with it. So, yeah, yeah, dude, it could be anything. It could be fitness. It could be law. It can be starting your own concrete, starting your own landscape. It yeah. Could be anything dude. Like, you learn the skill at the base level, you take it to the next level, you work overtime for free for yourself, and then hopefully it transpires into something where you can take it and run and stamp your name on it. Yeah, I, I was. it's funny, like, so I have so much more respect now for the people that are doing small businesses, no matter what it is. So like, like I hired a guy at work that does painting, and I knew the guy from high school and everything, and he started his own painting business, and he's working seven days a week, you know, and I asked him how he was doing hunting. He's like, I haven't been out. I've been, you know, trying to build this business and doing everything. And I'm like, he's grinding away. You know, he, he's got the same thing I do just for a different passion, yeah. you know, and a different yeah. vision with it. And I have so much respect for those, awesome. those people. I, I don't know me and the whole corporate lifestyle don't really mesh that well, but that's why we're all sitting here on a Wednesday. Is it a Wednesday? It's a Thursday. I don't even know. Thursday. <laughs> it's a Thursday. Exactly. Yeah. 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 But that's, yeah, it's, it's, it's amazing how that works. And, and, and again, that's why I thought that you guys would be so fitting to record this podcast. Cause it, it, it seems to be something that gets brought up a lot more. I mean, I'm sure you guys get more messages and stuff than I do about it, but people are like, Oh, how do you do this? I want to do this. I want to do that. And I understood, I understand now why, like when I first brought this up and I reached out to people, why it seemed like they were a little bit standoffish with it not from the fact that they're you know ignorant or don't want to help you it's just like so many people talk about it but don't actually want to put in all the effort to do it because it is it can be draining and i have a lot of lows that come along with it why am i doing this this oh we've been there you know and then you get and you get so many you know people that will be you know for lack of better terms hating on it that don't that think, well, that look at the, he's doing this. He thinks he's somebody and it's not the case at all, you know, and you just got to block all that out and just keep, you know, throw your sunglasses on and block out the haters. <laughs> there you go. Just keep yeah. rolling, dude. Like we've, before we even started recording, we all acknowledged that none of us are good killers. Like we don't, we're not great hunters. Like we're not going to be able to go out and teach a seminar on how to call in a bull. Yeah. But we stick to it and people relate to that. Yep. So we're sharing our experiences. People enjoy, you know, the fact that they fail, we fail, everybody does it. And you can, you can learn, make a business out of it, teach other people and still have a phenomenal time. Yeah. You don't have to be an animal. You don't have to be the best at whatever. It's just, just do it, man. Figure it out. And eventually it'll get there. If you try hard enough, you work hard enough and you have, I guess the self-awareness to find the right resources. Mm -hmm. You can figure it out. Yep. No matter what it is, you can figure it out. Connections. Don't be afraid to put yourself out, talk to people, do whatever. And, and great things can happen when you do that. Heck yeah. Yeah. Right. Marta. Right. <laughs> threw her headset back Delete. on. We'll she didn't. Bre- she didn't break the 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 <laughs> zoom. Yeah. Now she's now you can't blame break. it on me. Yeah. <laughs> she's she's gonna, gonna, she's I can hear poop. the ceiling fan on in there. In there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> she said, "Yeah." <laughs> no. She didn't even know she was going to be on this podcast, but you're, no, yeah. I have no idea. Yep. That's awesome. I know. Hey, I was, better than I was you, texting her last than... night. <laughs> oh yeah, better her than. <laughs> we don't have to make no, it. <laughs> no, I was texting Marty last night, like, hey, by the way, just so you know, no, I'm might glad be we a did podcast this. going on. I'm glad we did this. this yeah, no, this, this is, is great. Stuff. So is there anything else you guys want to add on Warren and Weathered and where you see that going and, and I guess where you can find information on that? 
Yeah. So Worn and Weathered is wornandweathered.com. We have Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. So you can find us there. It's all, for the most part, at Worn and Weathered. But you'll type it in and you'll find it. (laughs) Um, But we are really just trying to build a community of like-minded people. And I think that sounds so cheesy, but it's so true. It really stems from the same things that I felt whenever I first started my Instagram. I want to build a brand that people can wear who give a damn about conservation, who love to hunt because they're looking for adventure. They want to fill their freezer with meat. They want to maybe experience solitude in the wilderness, or maybe they want to experience camaraderie with friends outside that are just looking for so much more of the experience, I think, above all else. And to be able to just find a brand that waves that flag and is proud of yeah you know we have a new design coming out we do have a new design coming by the out. time this comes out it'll probably be released yeah so. sometime in how December. quick can you be because i can beat you <laughs> <laughs> uh, we well, could be on wednesday <laughs> okay all right you're good you got a lot of work ahead of you yeah i know yeah. <laughs> i had to, yeah, this is this is number three of four this week i've recorded so i got nice. oh yeah you got some work i'm rolling with it yeah, yeah. any other hunting related stuff we got off topic there a good bit yeah. Stuff? I don't know. Hunt, any good stories? Any up and coming? What's going on? No, nothing really that, yeah, nothing really that I can, that I feel that I need to share just because I, I, I've talked about on some of the other ones Previous, I recorded yeah. actually this week. So it's, I don't want to, people already get sick of hearing my voice. So I don't think they want to hear about it anymore, but yeah. we can, we can talk about that offline. But, um, yeah, what about, uh, anything else as far as your, you said your personal is outdoors alley, right? Yeah. It's outdoors underscore alley. Okay. When I first started, it was just straight outdoors alley and I spell my name A L L I E. So. Outdoors alley? Yeah. Were you around for that? (laughs) No, I just just picked up on it. No, he just, he has got a brain. (laughs) (laughs) I had about 10,000 followers at the time. And it was happening so frequently where I would post a photo and people would comment, great job, Sally. Like, we love what you do, Sally. We got another email today that and said, outdoor Sally. Oh, someone still Some, calling like, me flash, Sally? Some flashlight oh, man. review or something. Oh, man. Oh, that's so funny. So, yeah. So, I just made the decision that I needed to change it. People need to know my name is Allie, not Sally. And, yeah. So, I'm it's outdoor call you Sally. Oh, man. Out. I know. That was going around the first light office for a while, too. They were calling me Sally. That's we're getting funny. a new puppy. Oh, we are. Are you really? So yeah. Add, add to the workload. Yes. <laughs> oh, yeah. We're getting right. a white lab on December 8th. That's awesome. That's Abby. exciting. Abby. 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 Yeah. Gotcha. That's cool. Yeah. yeah. So we'll have, her, we'll have her in Florida. We'll have her back here for spring turkey. And hopefully we'll get her on a couple birds, you know? Yeah, that'd be sweet. I don't think we want her to be like a very strict bird dog, but it'd be cool to if yeah. she could flush something. You yeah, know, she, won't, yeah. she won't be a duck dog, but she'll be a potential upland hunting mm-hmm. yeah. dog. And she won't anything, be much of a pointer. Like, she'll be uh, just a get in there oh, and yeah. get a up. companion that helps you. Exactly. I would yeah. love. She's still going to sleep in bed with us. Yeah. Yeah. I want, like, it's been my dream to have a hunting companion that is a dog. Like, I want to be able to take my dog elk hunting with me. I thought Which that's I what know- you called Nick. <laughs> <laughs> yeah i feel like that sometimes <laughs> just shut up except, and go over here except he can hold a camera <laughs> no, i'm kidding Barely. wow no, 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 no. i'm kidding i'm kidding but i have always dreamt of having a dog with me while i'm hunting big game and i i think it's really silly and really stupid i know some people have done it before it's probably illegal in a lot of places it's illegal in idaho i know that for sure the regs say straight up a game and fish officer can shoot your dog if they see the dog pursuing game. Yeah. So, I mean, there is obviously some gray area there. If your dog isn't pursuing game, then you're all good. But it's definitely a line that is... That does not want to be crossed. Yeah, you don't... Yeah, you don't want to find out where that line is. No. Why would you run the risk? No. Yeah. So, Nick, what about you? Where can we find you at? Uh, Instagram... That's it. Okay. <laughs> Nick J. Berger. Gotcha. B-E-R-G-E-R. 
I followed you the other day, so. Did you? Yeah. I must have missed it. I'll you, click it back. You didn't even unfollow me. But I'll reciprocate. Oh, wow. You must be getting so many followers now. You yeah. just lose it all. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. Man, I feel Big really let bro. down. I use Instagram for like sports news. And like puppy uh, yeah. videos. And like puppy videos. <laughs> <laughs> I go on to see like what the football score was and who hit a home run, but yeah, that's about it. That's but your, I'll, that's I'll your business, so yeah. yeah. What's yours? It's just Bo, B-E-A-U dot Martonic. I I had like some like you know B Martonic eight mm. and then I'm like I'm just gonna make it yeah. my name so it's like because that was like the thing you always had more numbers searchable. and yeah yeah, yeah. Nick used to be something things. funny like that too oh yeah completely ridiculous yeah yeah <laughs> that's that's funny that's it's just the way I think it, everything started out like I started out with like Twitter first with it and it was yeah mm-hmm. that was just the way it was but I changed it like right when I started the company up and and just makes it a little more recognizable I guess totally yeah what about you Marta. I have Instagram, but I have a very odd name, so it's just M D Z Z I. So I took some letters out of there. M D D Z I. Z Z I. Okay, M D Z Z I. Gotcha. Yeah. If you go on Allie's page, you'll see us somewhere. Yeah, yeah we're on there. Yeah, she's in my story somewhere. right now. I think Nick was on one of my last posts. Okay. Yeah. Cool. It's so just personal. All right, guys. Any last uh, last comments here? Any last words? Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Good this luck to all the fellow Pennsylvania people. Yeah. Awesome. Try to stick it out this weekend. It's going to yeah. be rainy. It's going to be rainy, that's for sure. Sit through it. Well, hey, again, thanks to all of you for coming on and, and letting me in your cabin here and for sharing your batteries with me, Nick. Mm. Appreciate that. <laughs> oh, no doubt. So, all right, well, we'll sign off here. Thanks, everyone, for listening, and uh, we'll be back next week. Thanks so much for listening to this episode of East Meets West Hunt with your host, Bo Martonic. For more great content and to stay up to date, visit eastmeetswesthunt.com, Facebook at East Meets West Outdoors, and Instagram at East Meets West Hunt. If you enjoyed today's episode, please review and subscribe, and we'll catch you next time.